to understand the differences between men and women and how men and women can can coexist and even build a life together we should look at a very famous biblical story story a narrative that's well known to many people it's the story of the golden calf what is the story what happened essentially 40 days after the giving of the torah at sinai moses uh, apparently delayed the people had miscalculated they lost count and they thought that the 39th day was the 40th day and the mixed multitude came and suggested the idea of building a golden calf to worship it, to replace Moses as their new leader. And there was an outbreak of idolatry and uh, the rest we all know. Now, we're told that the women refused to participate in this sin. Categorically, wholesale, women did not want to participate. And as a reward for their refusal to participate, women were given the the Yom Tov, the holiday of Rosh Chodesh, of the new moon. So, first of all, why didn't women want to participate in the sin of the golden calf? That's one question. Another question is, why is Rosh Chodesh, why is the new moon a fitting, a, uh, an appropriate reward for not participating. So to understand all of this, we have to understand, first of all, some basic Jewish theology, some basic monotheism, and the nature of idolatry. So I know, what does this have to do with marital harmony? What does this have to do with men and women and gender? With, with this background, we'll be able to have a proper insight. What's the basis for idolatry? Basically, idolatry isn't atheism. It's not a rejection of God or denial in the belief in God. Essentially, what is idolatry? Idolatry is based upon the assumption that there is a God, a one and only God who is the supreme being, and that precisely because he's so supreme, he's inaccessible. And if you want something done, it's good to have, you know, a connection in a lower place. So if you want to get something done, you don't try to call the CEO. You know the secretary, and the secretary makes the appointments, and you get things done. And the CEO doesn't even have to know about it. He can be out, out, out at the golf course, and he doesn't even realize, but you got what you wanted. You got what you needed. So idolatry is basically the idea that, look, there are these powers in the universe, natural forces, and they are conduits, or they're intermediaries, for the power of creation. In fact, that's why in Talmudic literature, and throughout all rabbinical literature, the term, the technical term for idolatry is avedas keichovim, umazolais, the service of stars and constellations. Why? Because a mazel, you know, like mazel tov, what's a mazel? A mazel is from the word nozel, which means flow. A mazel is a conduit or a flow, a pipeline. The constellations are sort of a, an intermediary between the spiritual and the physical realm. And that's where the forces or the energies of creation are able to enter the universe. So in this sense, you look at a mazel, at a conduit or a pipeline of creative energy, and you say, wow, there's a lot of power coming through that. Uh, I want the power to come to me, so I better have good, uh, a good connection with that conduit or that pipeline to point it the way that I want to point it. And so you go to appease that pipeline, and you go to win its favor, and to make sure that you have a good relationship with the pipeline. And even though you realize that the pipeline is just a pipeline, and that the supplier is really the one and only God, but you know what? The supplier, he's got better things to do, and he's not so concerned with what's going on in your day-to-day -day life and the little minuscule details of this world. So you make sure that the intermediary, that the conduit is, that you're on good terms with it, and that's idolatry. The whole purpose of the 10 plagues in Egypt 
and the splitting of the sea and all the, the, the mighty and awesome way in which God took the Jewish people out of Egypt was to nullify the whole idea that God is aloof, that God is uh, too great to be involved in day-to-day -day things or even in any earthly things like political affairs, like one nation is subjugated to another nation and does does the infinite creator of the universe really have an opinion one way or another? And, and the Egyptian attitude, which was the prevalent attitude in the world at that time, was no, God doesn't. So therefore, Pharaoh said, with very uh, with uh, with chutzpah, with great uh, arrogance, he says, I, you know, you're coming to me to threaten that God's going to get involved. I'm calling your bluff. I don't really think it's going to happen. I think God's got better things to do. He's uh, above these kinds of things. And the whole point of the redemption, the miraculous and marvelous redemption, was to show, no, God, who is the same infinite one, who is the creator of all, he does get involved and he does care and he intervenes. So after all of this happened, what possible place was there for a, an argument for idolatry, for the mixed multitude? Basically, this is what happened. You have to picture the idolatrous argument. The idolatrous argument is, look, God doesn't get involved in our lives. It's just too mundane. It's beneath him. And then the argument back would be, you can imagine yourself there on the 40th day, or really the 39th day after the giving of the Torah. The argument, the counter-argument would be, what are you talking about? We just experienced God getting involved in our lives and taking us out of Egypt. And then the counter-counter argument would be, oh no, that was a mistake. You thought that was God? No. Here's what happened. We know that the Egyptian deity was the, the lamb or the sheep. That's why, for instance, um, Joseph, when he was the viceroy of Egypt, he said the Egyptians couldn't eat with his brothers because they were shepherds and because they ate sheep because that was the deity of the Egyptians. Or when it came time to make a sacrifice, what did God tell the Jewish people to use as their, as their sacrifice? A lamb, a sheep. Um, so the mixed multitude would say, we know that the, the sheep, the lamb, in constellation talk, in zodiac terms, we call that uh, Aries, the ram. The ram's a, a big sheep. Aries is the constellation, the reigning mazel, of Egypt. Yeah, well, he, he's over, he's done, he fell. Not because the God of all gods, the, 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 the supreme deity got involved, no. See, what happened is one constellation, one intermediary fell, and the next one came up. So what's after Aries in the zodiac is Taurus, the bull. So now it's the time of the bull. Now the bull took over. And if you want to make a bull to worship or a symbol of that. So you make a cute one, a cuddly one, you know, one that's docile and that you can, uh, you can be your pet uh, idol. So you make a calf, but calf is a bull. And that was the whole argument. And people listened to this and they thought, you know what? They've got something there because it played upon their fear. What was their fear? Their fear all along was we knew that our lives are too low and mundane and insignificant for God to get involved. We always knew that was the case. It was nice when we thought that the Creator was really getting involved, but you know what? The mixed multitude is right. The idolaters have, have had it right all along. God abandoned the world to intermediaries. They run the world as He pleases, and, and, and they're delegated or designated to, to, to run things. That's, that's what we have to deal with. We have to deal with these intermediaries. We, we, we were fools to think that uh, w when we needed something, we should call the CEO. That's just... It, let's go back to the old way. That was a very compelling argument, emotionally. Except for whom? Except for whom was it not compelling? So we said, for the women. So now's a question. Why, as a gender would women find that whole argument not very uh, convincing? And if we understand that, 
then we understand gender, we understand male and female, and then we can understand how the two can coexist in a marriage. In other words, what is it about a man that he is inherently insecure about the fact that God is really involved in this world? And what is it about a woman that she doesn't seem to have that problem? In other words, the mixed multitude was offering a solution to a problem that women don't have. The problem is, God can't be involved in your life, so the solution is, get an intermediary, a closer, a, 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 a second in command, a lieutenant God, so to speak, that you can get access to. And women said, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't have that problem. So to understand all this, we have to look at uh, the relationship between Shabbos and the six days of the week. There's a cycle, a pattern in time. Seven days. Every seven days is creation over again. God created the world in six days. On the seventh, he rested. That seven-day template just keeps repeating itself. So creation in microcosm is the seven-day cycle or pattern. And in that seven-day pattern, there's the six and there's the one. The six work days, the one rest day. What is the relationship between them? The six days, the six work days, represent six emotional facets. Six different colors of emotion, six different types of emotional expression. In Kabbalistic terms, those are called the midois, the emotions. Chesed, Gvura, Tiferes, Natsachoid, Yesoid. The seventh day is the sphere of Malchus, kingship. The six emotions, which are the six work days, are considered masculine days. The seventh day, Shabbos, the day of rest, is considered a feminine day. Why are they masculine and feminine? In spiritual terms, what's masculinity and what's femininity? What's the quality of masculinity and what's the quality of femininity in the spiritual realms? Is provider and recipient. Now, when we say provider and recipient, sometimes modern sensibilities already get uh, worked up. Hold on a second. The man's the provider, the woman's the recipient. This is, uh, this is old-fashioned. But if we understand what that really means, it shouldn't be a problem for any of us. First of all, let's just talk about it on the biological level. Just speaking about where babies come from, which we don't need a lesson in that, we're all pretty clear on the idea of human reproduction being a relationship of provider and recipient. And if we understand the biological relationship between mother and father, then we actually understand better what's a recipient. What kind of a recipient is the woman? She just takes something? Or she receives it, and then in her receiving, she nurtures it and develops something that's incomparably greater than what she had received. In other words, it's not a passive type of receptiveness. It's a receptiveness that actually returns dividends incomparably greater than the principle that was given to her. In other words, what was given to the woman, just biologically speaking here, genetically, what was transferred to this woman to, to incubate for, for nine months, compared to what she does at the end of the nine months, and you have a baby, there's no comparison at all. You want to talk about it not on a human level, but the, the same metaphor and the same uh, symbolism. You take a seed. A seed is a seed. What's a seed? What's a seed worth? Uh, a fraction of a cent. If you have a bag of seeds, maybe it's worth a few dollars. But a seed is whatever it is, it has its value. You put it in the ground, and the ground does whatever it does with the seed. The seed's gone, the seed decomposes essentially. 
but what grows, the produce that grows, is incomparably greater than what was put in the ground. So that's also the concept of malchus. Malchus is not just a vessel. It's a vessel that nurtures and gives back. Now let's talk about that um, again in terms of the six days of the week, the work days, and Shabbos. There's two ways of looking at that relationship. One way to look at it is the six days of the, the, the work week are the days where everything gets done. Shabbos, nothing gets done. So what's impressive? Where, are, where is human effort recognizable? The six days. In fact, Shabbos is completely dependent upon those six days because you only have on Shabbos whatever it is that you already provided for yourself on the six days. So if you didn't make a cholent on Friday afternoon, there's nothing to eat on Shabbos day. It's too late to do it. It's over. Pencils down. Turn in your test. So one way you could look at it, Shabbos is a totally dependent recipient. Nothing can get done on Shabbos. That's the definition of Shabbos. It's a day where nothing can get done. And the six days of the week that came before it, that's when everything gets done. Another way to look at it, though, is that Shabbos is the source of blessing for the six days that come after it. You can't be productive. You can't have a productive week. You can't work for six days if you're not coming out of a Shabbos. So there's two ways to look at it. There's the six days that give to the Shabbos after them. But then there's the Shabbos that's giving birth to, in a way, the six work days that come after her. So, again, what is this talking about? Femininity means to receive, but it means to receive something in a way where the product in the end is incomparably greater. Talk about this now on an emotional level, on a relationship level. A while back, a couple of Jewish ladies wrote a book, New York Times bestseller, called How to Talk to Kids So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. What was the whole book based on? It's a brilliant book, I mean, but there was one concept, and the concept was reflective listening. And it's a, it, reflective listening, it's not a difficult uh, concept to, to explain. It means somebody speaks to you, and you say back to them what they said. So that takes one page to describe how to do it. Why does it take a whole book? Because it's counterintuitive. Because you hear that and you think to yourself, well, that can't be helpful. No, you know what? When somebody comes to me and they start to talk, I have to give them advice. I have to point out where they were wrong. I have to figure out maybe even what, they, what they're telling me isn't even the truth. And maybe I, I'll, I'll help them. But no. Reflective listening, is, is, it's easy to do it, but it's very hard to convince yourself that it's effective until you actually see that there's a, there's a certain femininity, and men can do this too. It's not exclusive to the genders. There's a certain uniquely feminine um, ability to listen to someone, to hear them out, to allow them to fertilize you with an idea, and then without trying to change it or add something of your own, let the idea develop within you, and then just give it right back. That's the reflection, the reflective listening. That's also, by the way, why when we talk about the six emotions and Malchus, another symbol for that is the sun and the moon. Because the sun generates its own light, the moon is reflective light. So we have many different ways of looking at this. We could look at it as biological reproduction, we, where, where the woman receives something but then gives something back incomparably greater than what she got. We could look, look at this on a, on a chronological or time-based metaphor of the six work days that feed the Shabbos, but then the Shabbos which blesses the six days that come after it. We could look at it on an emotional level, reflective listening, being able to be a good listener and to give back to the person what they gave to you in a way that's 
qualitatively greater than what they gave to you. But all of this is talking about the difference between the spiritual concept of masculinity, which is the provider, and the spiritual concept of femininity, which is the recipient. Not the passive recipient, but the recipient which returns something of incomparably greater value. Now, what does this have to do with, we were speaking about before, men having a problem with feeling like God is aloof or inaccessible? Think about it like this. Why is a man the way that he is, and why is a woman the way that she is? Both come from aspects within God and they're both true. There is an aspect of God which is the creator, the deliverer, the delivery system, a very father-like role. Um, without being cavalier about it, but just as a fact, not that it's the right thing, but technically, fatherhood is a very small commitment. I mean, biologically speaking, to be a father it doesn't take a major commitment. It's not a big involvement. And there is, in a sense, an aspect of godliness where God is the creator and boom, he's done his work. He did his job. Those are the six emotions, the, the emotional energy which the creator injected into the creation. And then he's done. He's done his part. And now from here on out, it's the role of Malchus, of the feminine aspect of godliness, to develop that, nurture it, and then not just to give birth to it, but what is, what is motherhood more than just giving birth? She's taking care of it. Okay? So when we talk about the, the feminine aspect of God, which we call Shechina, literally that means Shoichen or Shoichenes, she dwells, or she, she's in the fray, she's down here, that's why when we talk about the effects of exile, of Golos, we say Shrinta Bagolosa, that God's feminine aspect, his motherly or maternal aspect, is what is in exile. In other words, there is that aloof creator that sort of just set it in motion, and now he's stepping back. He doesn't have to be involved in it. But at the same time, there is the feminine aspect of God, which cannot separate herself from what's going on. To the contrary, she's very much involved in it, in the ongoing creation, in every detail and every aspect of it, of nurturing it, and of being involved in the, in, in, in the world, no matter what condition it's in, even if it's in a lousy and rotten condition, and she's right there, she can't back away. When a man thinks of God, what aspect of God does he think of? What aspect of God does he relate to? Well, since he comes from, that's what, in fact, not only he comes from, that's what makes him masculine that's what makes him a man he comes from that aspect of god which is the creator so he thinks of god in that way god did his job he did his fatherly duty and you know he was there at the time when he was needed but he's done when a woman intuitively thinks of god what does she think of she thinks of shrina she thinks of how God is in the world, nurturing it, keeping it going, sustaining it, and being involved in every detail of it, even the, the most mundane, even the most unglamorous, or even the, the, uh, the nitty-gritty, the real down-and-dirty aspects of life down here in this world. So, when you go to a man and you say, God is unavailable, would you like to find some created power that's higher than you, so it's got more power than you've got, but not so high that it's unavailable? A man thinks about that and he thinks, hmm, that sounds compelling. We might need something like that. Something like that could come in handy. You go to a woman and you say, hey, listen, since God is not available, and she says, <laughs> I don't agree with the premise. What are you talking about God is not available? 
because she's thinking of the feminine aspect of God, which is very much here in this world. Okay, now, once we understand this, now we can really understand not just why men and women theologically are different, but why in practice, so there's the theology and there's the practice. The theology is the idea, but the practice is actually how it, it bears out. Why they're so different. When you're talking about the, the mas masculine spirituality, the energy of creation, the doing, essentially what are you talking about? When does a man feel most connected to God? When he's doing holy things. So therefore a man has to go to shul. And he has to sit in the study hall and learn. And he has to have time-related com uh, commitments, mitzvahs that are coming up on a regular basis. And this is what, basically, he needs to be programmed, you know, he has to be given a heavy schedule of Jewish activities, and that makes him feel godly. Because the aspect of godliness that he readily relates to is God the doer. The one who makes a creation. And when a man's not doing anything... He doesn't feel much of anything. In fact, it's kind of uncomfortable. A woman, on the other hand, she does not need to be doing. And in fact, Judaism recognizes this and exempts her from positive time-bound time commandments and tells her, that's not what you need. A man needs to be doing Jewish all the time to feel connected to God. But a woman, as opposed to constantly doing Jewish like a man, a woman is able to be Jewish, which is very hard for a man. It's very hard for a man to be Jewish. He can do Jewish, but being Jewish is very hard. Which helps us to understand maybe a little bit why Jewish identity is passed through the mother. Who you are your being Jewish is something your mother gives you because a mother, a woman, is able to be Jewish. Now, when you're called up to the Torah and it's the Aliyah is according to Kohen and Levi and Israel, that's the male thing because that's a tribal affiliation. So different tribes do different jobs. And so what you do, the way that you're occupied, that's what you get from your father. But your essence, your being, the fact that you are a Jew, to be a Jew, you get from a mother, because being Jewish is uniquely f feminine. Somebody once asked me, came up to me, and he said he was from a delegation from uh, a synagogue from another country, without giving too many details, and he said to me, we have, we have, a, we have a problem in our community, and it's, we're trying to convince women he says, women, the women in our community are feeling disenfranchised. And we're trying to convince them that they have an important place in the synagogue. So I said to him, well, why are you trying to do that? He says, because they, they feel disenfranchised. So I said, so they feel disenfranchised. So you're going to lie to them and tell them, no, 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 you're not disenfranchised. You are important in the synagogue. So what are you offering to them? They're not dumb. <laughs> you're going to fool them. The whole concept of a synagogue was made for the gender of people who don't feel Jewish if they're not, doing, if they're not heavily programmed with Jewish activity on a regular time-bound basis. It's something that fulfills a need that men have. If a man is not in shul on Yom Kippur, he doesn't feel like a Jew. It's very hard for a man to say, I'm going to stay home and make peanut butter sandwiches for five-year-old children on Yom Kippur, and that that should be holy, that that should be godly. It's a very difficult thing for a man because he's into the doing, not the being. So I told him, instead of trying to convince women that they have an equal share in the synagogue, which isn't even true, and there's no need for it to be true, because who assumes that the synagogue is the, the apex of Jewish life anyway? Why don't you endeavor to 
tell women something that's true, which is try to explain to them that the synagogue is of secondary importance as far as Jewish locations go. The synagogue is of secondary importance to the Jewish home. So the man's place, really, where, who excels in the synagogue is, is the man. Because the synagogue is about what you do. But the home is about who you are. And that's why the home is really, that's the woman's place. There's a, there's a saying, a, the man is king of his castle. It's not a Jewish statement. That there's, you don't find that anywhere in the teachings of the sages. It's not a Jewish ideal. The Jewish ideal is a keres habayis, the mainstay of the home, the one who dictates and uh, determines the whole character and the whole nature of the home is the woman. And l lest we, we think that that is not, that that's somehow uh, any less important, we should start to think about it in practical terms. Ask anybody who became seriously committed to Judaism on their own. Somebody who did not come from an observant background and made a serious commitment to Jewish observance in their life by decision, by choice. And go take a poll, take a survey, and ask a hundred such people. In your development, in your growing closer to Jewish observance, what was decisive in your experience? Something that happened in shul or something that happened in a Jewish home? And I will guarantee you 99% of people will respond had something to do with chicken soup. It had something to do with cute kids saying uh, parsha sheet at the, at, the, at the Shabbos table. It had something to do with a place where you knew that you could come in and you would always be offered a glass of tea. It had nothing to do with a shul. Do we need shuls? Yeah, we need shuls, because we, there are Jewish men, and if we wouldn't have shuls, what would Jewish men do to feel Jewish? That's also why we need rabbis. Rabbis teach you how to do Jewish stuff. They're experts in instructing you in doing Jewish stuff, and that's why rabbis should be men. But Jewish mothers, Jewish mothers instruct you how to be a Jew, and that's why Jewish mothers should be women, which works out rather well actually, because it's the way it tends to be. So, uh, let's go back to the original, the original story, the sin of the golden calf. The sin of the golden calf was appealing to a fear that's uniquely a male insecurity. God is the creator, the father. He did his paternal job and is removed from the scene and he's not accessible. And therefore the man is looking for something that he feels is more, uh, more available. The woman is relating to, you know, let me ask a question. Is God creator? Or creation. So the Jewish answer is both. God's not creator to the exclusion of being creation. That might be monotheistic, but it's not Jewish monotheism. Jewish monotheism is not just there's one God, that there's one anything. There's nothing but Him. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Hashem is oneness. So he's creator and creation. So it's actually somewhat, uh, it's a sad commentary on our priorities that we're more impressed with God the creator than God the creation. We're more impressed with what God does rather than what God is, than the essence. Not because one is more impressive than the other. It's a sad commentary on us that perhaps because historically speaking, we are dominated by a masculine outlook, which is probably an influence that we get from non-Jewish 
nations around us. So we do tend to uh, put a premium on that which is masculine. But that's not authentically Jewish. Judaism will tell you that it's, what's impressive about God is not that he created. The fact that God created something, let me ask you a question. And if God didn't create, would he still be God? Creation is a project. What's impressive about God is that he's absolute existence. In fact, that's the best definition we have for God. That which exists because it exists. It needs no reason, no cause to exist. It just exists. Essence. Being. And that's a much more feminine trait. So, why were women not so compelled by this whole argument of idolatry? What do I need it for? I got God right here. In the here and now, even in the very non-glamorous moments, even in the pedestrian and the mundane day-to-day stuff, God's right here. And we said women were, were rewarded. What was their reward? The celebration of the new moon, of Rosh Chodesh. Why does that make sense? Because the moon is that reflective light. That ability to receive, to be a true recipient. So, how can we apply this in very, just to sum it up, and some, what, do we can, what can we take away in some very practical advice here? Okay, so first of all, women should know. When men come home, it's a very difficult place for them to be because it's the place where they come and they have to submit to not being in charge, not feeling in control, not doing. It's very, um, it's very uncomfortable. And yet, that's what they need to do. Men need to come home and to stop. When a man comes home in a, in a small way, even if it's a Wednesday evening, it's Shabbos. In a certain way, when a man is coming home to his wife, he's coming to Shabbos, like the six days lead into Shabbos. In other words, he has to cease working. He has to just be. Because now he's on the woman's turf, and it's the woman's way of being, which is not the doing, but the being. Women should respect that and understand that that's a difficult and uncomfortable transition. And to aid that, to encourage that, by making sure you're not competing with your husband to see um, what you can do. Let him be the doer. When he comes home, he needs to just stop doing, and you should encourage that. You should encourage the not doing. Not discourage doing, encourage the not doing. Like they say, don't just do something, sit there. That's on the woman's side. On the man's side, it's very important for him to realize that his whole purpose is to provide the energy in the relationship. The woman is going to receive it and she's going to turn it into something incomparably greater than what she was given. But he's got to initiate it. The energy has to come from him. When a man comes home, no matter how tired he is, no matter how uh, beaten down he feels, no matter what kind of day he had, he better not come home to receive anything emotionally from his wife. That's unhealthy. He's not meant to be a recipient. He's not built to be that way. He's meant to be the provider. So before he walks in the door, even if she was out at work all day too, because it's a different thing emotionally and spiritually for a woman to be out at work all day and then for a man to be out at work all day. Even if the both of them are at work all day and they walk into the house at the same time. When they walk into the door, the man is the man, the woman is the woman. That means the man should muster whatever amount of energy he has, whatever little bit of positivity, of happiness, of, of, of joy that he can scrape together and just Put it together and put it out there and give that to that woman. That's all you got to do. Don't come in there emotionally needy. This is the problem, by the way, with the nice guys. We all know about, you know, 
the, the good girls who don't go to the nice guys, they go to the bad boys. We don't understand. Why don't they go to the nice guys? We want them to go to the nice guys. They go to the bad boys. You know why? Because nice is an acronym. Neurotic, insecure, clingy, and emotional. Nice doesn't really mean nice. It's not altruistic. Nice means, what do I got to trade with you in order for you to give me validation? A woman does not want a nice guy who's trying to get validation. What does she really want is a good man. A good man doesn't need validation. Unfortunately, so few good men, so she takes the bad boy because at least he's not trying to be clingy. He's not an emotional vampire. But what she really wants is the good man. The good man is the giver, the consummate giver. He comes into the home, and even if he's only got a little to give, but that's what he gives. And then the woman takes that, and she doesn't need a, she doesn't need a lot. But once she's get, when she can be the recipient, she can take that, she can develop that, that little bit of energy that he brings to the house, and she turns that into a home. She turns that into an entire environment in which they can thrive. So really, that's the way it works the best. That's the way that it's healthiest, when the flow is working that way. And then both of them are happy, and both of them are uh, doing what they do best. Just one thing to add, ultimately, as the world gets closer and closer to the way that it's supposed to be, um, the emphasis is more and more on the essence of things, the way things really are, instead of the way they function. And so... Women aren't going to have to learn how to be more like men, although that was a major emphasis in the past you know, 50, 60 years. But really, it's not that women are going to have to learn to be more like men. Men are going to have to learn to be more like women. When the world is perfected, when Mashiach is here, and uh, godliness won't be something relegated to a religious experience, godliness will just be ubiquitous. Godliness will be uh, the... The, the norm, that which is obvious, and just walking down the street breathing will be a spiritual experience. So men will need to become more in touch with their feminine side and able to realize that there's a, there's a certain greatness in, in, in appreciating God that is present in the here and now. And it's much more... Uh, It's much more closer to what God really is, even more than the God who created or even who continues to create uh, and is the source of the energy, but it's really the God who is the, um, the essence of being or the, the, the essence of existence, absolute existence. So those are some deep ideas and their application to uh, men and women and their emotional relationships. And God willing, some of these uh, insights will be helpful to you to apply in your own home. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe and hit the notification bell below for daily pearls of Jewish wisdom.